go for it. Okay, so hi all. Welcome everyone, it's nice to see you all. I'm Federica and I'm the chair of uh, ISB 2022 and also a member of the International Society for Biocreation Executive Committee. And we are really excited to welcome you all today for the first session of this year's Biocreation Conference. We uh, kindly ask you to post questions for our panelists and speakers in the Q&A and chat and we will constantly monitor those. Uh, and we encourage you to use uh, uh, our Slack workspace and channel uh, if you have any issue and join the meeting uh, or uh, um, during uh, the meeting itself. So uh, this year we have uh, a virtual conference once again that is going to feature a free virtual session, the first one today, April 7, uh, then we have one in June 7, and uh, the third one that is going to feature also the annual general meeting, uh, and uh, the post session will take place October 1st, uh, 4th. So if you register, um, you can do it on a rolling basis for the year, and this allows attendance at all the sessions uh, of the ISB 2022. And you can find out more on our website. Uh, we have said, I would like to introduce uh, uh, this year's uh, um, organizing committee. So I'm chairing uh, and uh, Sushma, who is also um, in the executive committee, is uh, my co-chair. And uh, then there is Philippe Lemercier from uh, uh, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, Nicolas Milleras, NIH, and Charles Stapley Hoyt, Harvard Medical School. <laughs> And uh, um, since uh, we really hope this is going to be the last uh, uh, virtual conference of ISB, because we are planning uh, to resume uh, in-person conferences in 2023, and indeed we have a location for ISB 2023 that uh, is uh, now going to, um, please, uh, next slide, Charlie. Okay, it's going to take place uh, in Padova, Italy in spring uh, 2023. We are still, uh, date is TBD, at, uh, but still it's going to be in the spring. And uh, uh, you're more than welcome to express your interest to be part of uh, the ISB 2023 organizing committee. So today's session is uh, going to feature a panel discussion first uh, that is going to be chaired by Philippe Lemercier and it's on promotion and dissemination of bioequation efforts. We are then going to have a short break, like 10 minutes, and then we will have four invited speaker talks chaired by Sushma Naitani. And uh, we will say, the, please, Philip, I think we can start with the panel discussion. Hello, my name is Philippe Lemercier. I am from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, Swiss Post Group. I'm based in Geneva, and the weather is absolutely terrible today. So it's raining cold. Perfect time for a Zoom meeting, actually. Uh, today, I have the privilege to chair the panel discussion about bioecuration. So, bioecuration is a kind of special discipline in, in science. It's kind of difficult to find ways to, to, uh, to publish or to get grants, to find metrics for grants. Got a lot of issues that are going to be discussed today because of the title of this one hour panel discussion will be Promotion and Dissemination of Bioecuration Efforts. And today we have the privilege to have four outstanding panelists. So in alphabetical order, uh, we have Cecilia Arrighi, Rezarta Islamaj, uh, Peter Karp, and Sandra Orkard. So I'm going to let the panelists discuss now or present themselves. Maybe we start with Cecilia for presentation and uh, see you later. Okay, so uh, thank you all. Um, Thank you for the invitation. My name is Cecilia Arigi. In case uh, you don't know me, I am a research associate professor at the University of Delaware. I work at the Protein Information Resource directed by Dr. Kathy Wu. And on top, uh, you can see kind of my career path. Uh, I'm a biologist and I did my PhD uh, this way, doing um, uh, studying uh, the temperature conformational change of a fatty acid binding protein that was in Argentina a long time ago. Uh, then I moved uh, to conduct my postdoctoral uh, research at NIH, uh, moving from studying one single protein to studying uh, the cell and looking into um, the red tromer complex, which is involved in the recycle of receptors. Then in 2005, I decided to change gears by leaving the bench from the wet lab and moving to a computer bench. Uh, that's where I joined the PIR. 
and uh, PIR is part of the Unicro Consortium, as you may know. Um, so curation is a big deal. Um, so interestingly, my first task at PIR was to serve as a naive user to improve the website. So that was fantastic because I came from the wet lab and I, I didn't probably know much about the, the behind the scenes, um, but I couldn't leave my beloved protein. So I started to curate uh, protein families that are now uh, used to create rules for annotation and propagation in Uniprot, like the Uni rules. Um, of course, I learned Swiss Prot curation, uh, being in, in Uniprot, that, that I had to sacrifice myself and go to Geneva for a few weeks. Uh, but after being in the biocuration business for a while, I noticed that uh, you can make use of any help to uh, help you with the biocuration business. Um, so we have to, um, I have to start involved in text mining because I thought that would be a good way of helping me with uh, the curation. So I collaborate with groups that develop text mining tools as well as uh, BioCreative, which is a community-wide effort to uh, create uh, tools and, and methods to help in uh, text mining tasks. Um, I also teach bioinformatics and, and bio-curation there at the graduate level. I participate in advisory boards when invited, and I'm a former elected member and chair of the ISB executive board. It is a pleasure to be here. Okay, I think the next panelists can introduce them, themselves. Uh, we have Sandra Orchard and Peter Karp and uh, uh, Risata. Apologies, I thought we were in alphabetical order. So yes, I'm Sandra Orchard from the uh, EMBL EBI. Um, so my career is the path is a little different from Ceci's because I went straight into uh, pharmaceutical research once um, finishing uh, my education and uh, was at Hoffman LaRoche or Roche Products, as it was known in the UK for 20 years, uh, starting off as a bench scientist, working on it, trying to inhibit kinases. Um, but as in the last few years, I was working very much on new uh, target identification and validation. So effectively, was working on bioinformatics um, before I even knew what the word meant. Uh, fell over Swiss Prot in those days, uh, on the days when it had the horrendous yellow, blue and pink website. I've never found anyone that's admitted to being responsible for that colour combination. Um, but uh, So I was a user before I moved to the EBI. Um, and when uh, Roche decided to close down in the UK, I certainly wasn't interested in moving back to the bench science. So moving to the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute seemed like a fairly natural uh, step. So I originally trained as a Swiss prop. It was just becoming Uniprop those days, 20 years ago. Uh, curator, um, also worked on Interpro, on gene ontology, uh, the, started the intact molecular interaction database, I was the first curator for that. Um, so I've then ended up full circle and now come back to being responsible for curation at the EBI in Uniprot and uh, gene ontology. And with that, I'll hand over to someone else. Oh, and I have, I've also been EC, a former EC member and former chair of the uh, ISP as well. Okay, so I guess I'll go next. I'm, I'm Peter Karp, and I, uh, I did my PhD in computer science at Stanford a number of years ago, and actually did work on a bioinformatics PhD at that time before there were really any bioinformatics programs. And uh, I, I was interested in developing AI methods for scientific discovery and studied how uh, biologist Charlie Yanofsky discovered the gene regulation mechanism of attenuation. And uh, yeah, Yanofsky was on my dissertation committee and uh, I, I read many of their papers and talked to Yanofsky extensively about the, the, the reasoning steps that they used to discover attenuation and, and wrote a program that could reproduce some of those uh, reasoning methods. And in, in some sense, I've been kind of over the course of my career, um, kind of expanding from that general, from that work in, in many ways in that at the, part of my dissertation was to write a, a computer model of the gene expression of the tryptophan operon in E. coli. So essentially one 
modeling one operon within one bacterium. Well, the next step in generalizing from there uh, was to create, was to describe the metabolism. So, so the tryptophan operon codes for tryptophan, the tryptophan biosynthetic pathway. Uh, we then started the EcoPsych project that combines the, um, the G full genome of E. coli, which actually hadn't even been sequenced at the time we started. We had an incomplete genome uh, with the metabolic pathways of E. coli. And we eventually added in all of, all of the transcriptional regulation of E. coli. Um, so Eco, EcoPsych is still going on today. That's, that's one of my projects is the model organism database for E. coli. Uh, another, we, we've also been expanding the number of organisms as more and more bacterial or bacteria became sequenced. We began developing similar pathway genome databases for other bacteria. Uh, we, we now have 19,000 of those databases in our biocyte collection. And another key database we developed along the way was the MetaPsych database that describes curated metabolic pathways from all domains of life. And that's MetaPsych is now at 3,000 pathways. Funny to see two of my colleagues look the same direction at the same time, but they're presumably in different places. So I'm not sure what, but anyway. Um, Right, so MetaPsych is a curated database for of, of metabolic pathways from all domains of life, covers 3,000 different pathways. Um, so I, I now direct the bioinformatics research group within the Artificial Intelligence Center at SRI International, which is a nonprofit research institute about one mile from Stanford. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Hi, I'm Ezart Islamai, and I'm, I really appreciate being in this panel. Uh, with Cecilia, we have a long um, relationship as we've been working with BioCreative for many years, but Sandra and Peter, I've only known you by reputation. Um, I also have a computer science background. Hello. Excellent. <laughs> um, I have a computer science background. I got my PhD in computer science from University of Maryland College Park. And um, I also had an, a, 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 a working on bioinformatics, but my my thesis research was on was on sequence prediction and splice site predictions, which I and I developed SpliceBoard, which is uh, a selective, although I do not work on that anymore. Um, we, I started my postdoc at, at NCBI um, working on text mining and bionet, bio, medical language, natural language processing. And it's been 10 years now that I am a staff scientist at the text mining research group. We do um, a lot of uh, work on text mining and biomedical natural language processing. Um, and work both on tool development, such as PubData, um, software tools, such as DNorm and Genome Plus, as well as um, we built fully annotated corpora for AI and machine learning for um, biomedical entity prediction, such as NCBI disease corpus, NLM chem, NLM gene, which are our, our latest um, productions. Um, my research focuses on computer assisted biomedical data curation. And um, this involves three, um, three areas, the way I see it. Um, in order to, to build gold standard lexical resources, which are valuable for building accurate AI algorithms, we also need to um, to help curators um, understand what they need, understand the nature of the data, and build appropriate uh, annotator tools, assistant tools, and that is a recent tool that we developed called TeamTat, so that we use their time efficiently and they are able to intuitively and interactively uh, use the system so that they enter their expertise without losing their time. 
um, have the data, select the data so that it is important, that helps the algorithm learn better and then develop better alg algorithms. I have been involved with uh, BioCreative, NLM Curation at Scale workshop and other um, venues. And I am very passionate about interoperability of data and tools. I've been involved with BioC since the beginning, which is a minimal format for uh, facilitating uh, data and um, text annotation sharing um, between data and tools. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I think we will start with the different topics we are uh, going to speak about. So the first one was about publication dissemination. For example, we made some publication recently. It was difficult to find a journal that accept procuration paper. And even then, it was difficult to find reviewers. So the question is, where could we publish uh, biocuration? Is there better places? And how often should, should we write a paper about, for example, the database? So well, one thing, oh, ah, go ahead, Sandra. Well, all I was going to say was uh, one thing we have been actually trying to do at Uniprot is to not publish just in database and NAR and, and related, but to actually try and push the message out to new communities by targeting journals um, that are not so far natural uh, first choice of, of published, well, for, uh, you know, the one, the one that appears nat uh, the natural choice for us to publish in. So, for example, we did a lot of work on Alzheimer's funded by the NIA and also uh, uh, a UK charity uh, over the last few years. So we published that in an uh, Alzheimer's clinical journal. It took us a while to find one that was willing to publish a database paper, but with a lot of nagging of editors, uh, we managed it um, and uh, got the paper out um, and hopefully we were in that way targeted a new audience. So I think there's a danger if we just stick to uh, one or two niche journals that seem the most suitable for us that actually will then be preaching to the converted, as it were, rather than taking out the message and showing our work to new audiences. So yeah, kind of so, <laughs> yeah, so I was going to say, I give that the example as well. Um, so I would say for the technical papers where you describe the database, it's okay for doing the database NAR. But if you want to really reach out to the, the community of users uh, or potential users, you want to do the kind of work where you show the application or, or the value of the database. Um, and uh, basically, for example, we also have a community curation paper um, that was uh, in the BLOS biology, but it's not a research paper. I contacted, they, they have a specific, for example, a specific um, track for community, I don't remember exactly the name uh, of, the, of, of the type of paper, but it was basically, I contacted the editors and said, this is what we're trying to achieve. Are you interested in this and that? And they say, yes, submit. And then I think you have to be proactive as well in contacting and looking for the journals for the broad audience you want to reach out and also um, contact the editors of the journals just to make sure that they understand what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've published in nucleic acids research database issue for many years, and that's been a good venue in many ways, but I've, I've been concerned on an ongoing basis that not many biologists may look at that journal and that some of our prime users uh, are just not even looking at that channel. Another concern I have about NAR is that we, we started a policy at Biopsych a number of years ago that we would force people to sign up for a free account. That is, uh, we would have a, a paywall of sorts, uh, a blocking message after a person had seen 10 or 20 pages of our site that we would force them to sign up because we, we uh, uh, for free because we thought it was important to communicate with users on an ongoing basis to educate them about the database. Now, nucleic acids research developed a policy that they won't publish articles by databases that have that kind of forced sign up, even if it's free. Uh, they consider that uh, too much. 
So we've started looking at other journals to publish in because communication with users is just so important. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about how we use those email addresses that we do harvest from accounts people sign up. But we've published in Frontiers journals, uh, the database journal to some degree, although I think they have may have a similar policy. I'm not quite sure. But, um, you know, it's so hard to to reach users uh, that we decided to make that trade off of uh, forcing users to sign up for free accounts. Um, I have a comment. And um, the question of where should I publish, I think it's an important one. And it's especially important for new authors. Um, however, my recommendation would be to select an open access venue because it allows for broader dissemination and also easier text processing and use of the results in downstream text mining methods. It's the use and inclusion of the papers in various sample data sets, et cetera. Basically, it increases your leadership, it increases the access and uh, uh, how you reach more people. I think more scientists should, should select open access findings. The, the other thing, I, I totally agree, Resarta, with the, with the open access. Um, I, there's one more thing that I wanted to add, the preprints, right? We can always make broad, more broadly accessible uh, our, our information through preprint. So we could, that's another venue if while you're looking for uh, your journal. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the institutes need to support. I mean, at uh, EMBL, obviously, it's mandatory that we go open access if possible. They do leave some flexibility, particularly for the research groups who sometimes don't have that as an option because they're tied in with bigger consortia. Um, but uh, even if we, for some reason, want to target a journal that isn't itself open access, we then can then pay for the uh, article to be made open access. And they, if necessary, EMBL will underwrite that. Although at Uniprop we're lucky and we have the funds to do it anyway, um, but you know, usually. Uh, but um, yes, I, I think there does have to be a degree of institutional support. I mean, it's getting better. There are is more choice now, but sometimes you would uh, feel that you're um, compromising your paper or some, uh, to get it into a journal that is open access in the early days of open access. Whereas if there's funding behind you, it does make that much easier. I have a question. So once you get your paper published, um, what about uh, social media that we could use to reach the users? So what kind of social media? Is it efficient? Um, what would you say about that? We, we're active users of uh, Twitter. Um, so everything we do, we tweet out and comment on. And with that, we find it quite reasonably interactive uh, and um, also a surprisingly good a place to find information like pe all the people shouting about papers have picked up uh, quite a few in there over the years of interesting papers um, we have a Facebook account but I have to say it's not as um, successful as Twitter people we've had the same number of followers for quite a long time now possibly because we don't support it as actively um, we haven't got brave enough to try TikTok yet <laughs> Not quite sure we could uh, distill everything that we do down to a six second video or whatever the restriction is. But yes, I mean, it's it's an easy way to reach a lot of people for free. It's an easy way to meet, uh, to reach a generation that is becoming more and more um, social media aware and uh, possibly less, you know, less aware of the uh, more traditional forms of publishing. So we do very actively support it. I think social media is incredibly important and I think it's a it's a research research project in on it and on itself because different social media require different ways of how to how to interact with it um, but also it it has two aspects like success and promotion and dissemination depends both on a strong web presence as well as um, 
uh, interaction with social media. Um, promoting new articles, promoting databases, conferences, workshops, uh, actually works much better on social media. It also increases participation and viewership and readership. Um, I've also seen people promote papers on TikTok and they do a great job on it. Um, but as I said, it's it's a it's a research project in and of itself, and it requires um, it, it it requires engagement. Um, with the we promoted the biocreative workshop with Cecilia um, heavily. We used LinkedIn, Twitter, and we learned from that experience, and we used it for the NLM curation at scale workshop, and. So we did the traditional mailing lists, we published a blog post announcement, we advertised widely, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, I believe it reaches different audiences. And, uh, but we also had the support of the tech team and uh, a very current web page, which was uh, very actively um, updated with the new information on speakers on, on program as well. So, uh, all of it needs to work together to, to have the best experience and outcome. I'd say we, we have a bit of a credit assignment problem in that we use a variety of promotional approaches from email to social media, but it's hard to know which ones work the best and how much engagement we're getting from different routes. So if, if people have ideas on how to measure the success of different communication channels, I'd be interested to hear that. Like I said, it's a research problem. <laughs> well, with the, with the tweets, at least uh, you, can, you can see at how many retweets you have. And also we do see with functionalities that we introduce in Uniprod or blogs that we promote or things that we have a spike on the usage or, or certain of or certain things when we, after we tweet, either after for a conference or something. So I, I do, we do see that they work, but whether which one is better, probably I don't, it's, it's difficult to, to address. Okay, so maybe we should move to the, the next topic, which is about the metrics and citation for bioclusion data. So uh, how do we get more citation, for example, for data set? Um, how do you find the users? Uh, how do you convince funding bodies that database is being used? So what kind of metrics you can really um, get to convince that your data is important and used? Okay, so for for there were many questions, kind of many things within that question. So in terms of uh, how do you find users for your data, I guess that was one of them. Is that right? Yes. How do you get? Uh, so I, I think you when I mean when you create your data, data says you already have users in mind. You should not do it just for the sake of creating some resource there, right? So I think um, there's some community that express the need for such data. Um, I think uh, for users to, to find what you have or, or find utility, uh, it's good to have, I find blogs and short papers showing the application uh, to the user community um, that you believe is your target as we explained before. Um, and I think attending uh, conferences related to those, not, not the typical, not a bio-curation conference, but in addition to a bio-curation conference, you want to go to those conferences where uh, you can present uh, your resource to the users, right? So that would be um, one, one way that I think you can expose more um, and, and educate the community in terms of how to cite and how to uh, use the data. And as far as actual measuring metrics, we do all the traditional things, um, the Google Analytics, the IP addresses, obviously GDPR has limited a little bit what we're allowed to do now. Um, one thing we've also started doing lately 
Uniprot's one of those resources that everyone kind of takes for granted. So a lot of people will use our data very early in the project. And by the time they've written, right, written up, they've actually forgotten or just take for granted that, that, that the, the data has been used and we don't get a citation. Um, but it's not un particularly unusual that although we haven't got a citation, they do mention us somewhere. Uh, and one of the things we've set up actually with Europe Med Central as it's in-house, uh, is to um, look for mentions of Uniprot in places like the uh, methods and materials, because one of the things you can do is, is search by section. Um, and if we find it that it's mentioned there, even though we haven't been cited, we can uh, take that as a, um, uh, an indication that they've used our data. Um, so we're trying to be a little bit more creative on um, measuring not some, uh, data reuse, really, how, um, how much the work is being taken, reused for reanalysis. Um, just, but without necessarily the traditional citation, which is the uh, easy way of counting usage. Yeah, the other thing you can look at is the help desk, right? Because you get a lot of complaint. You, you learn from what people look at and and what uh, when they complain that your when your resource is not working, you have um, a, a lot of data there too. Yeah. That, that comes up very quickly on Twitter. If a Uniprop goes down, Twitter tells about it faster than Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a very good measure. <laughs> than our, than our in-house metrics usually. <laughs> it's it's biased data though. It only shows you the negative aspects of it. Yeah, that's I understand, but it shows that is that people care about the resource that they are using it. So in mm -hmm. a way, uh, they're active users. I understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, we use email a lot to communicate with users, and we, we gather email addresses from a lot of different sources, including um, when people register at our site. Um, and when we curate articles, we collect email addresses from the articles we curate, assuming that people whose work we curate uh, are probably going to be interested in the database that we're developing. <clears throat> we, we, it, the thing is, it takes decades to accumulate an, an, an email list, a, a large email list. We now have a list of over 50,000 people. Um, and the thing is that for databases, there's not only trying to reach your users initially, but there's an ongoing education problem for database databases. Because for example, every year there are new graduate students uh, in the life sciences who may not know about uh, our resources, who we have to try to reach and educate about how to use our resources. Um, one thing we do is when people sign up for an account at our site, we actually have scripts set up that send a series of email messages, like one a week for three or four weeks to educate people on different aspects of our site. Because we found that as our site has gotten more and more complex over the years, any given user really only is gonna understand a fraction of the functionality that the site provides. So that's why we started this series of email addresses. Now, I think one, one challenge in biocuration is when we're trying to educate new users or even existing users, how do we communicate how much information, how much data a database provides? I mean, of course you can give a byte count or something like that, that's not too meaningful I think either to a computer scientist or to a biologist. Um, so some of the metrics that we try to use are in, in our databases, whenever we curate information, we cite the source of the curation in the database and we can count how many citations exist in the database. So that's one of our primary measures is the number of articles from which the curated information is derived. And from our MetaPsych, for our MetaPsych database, for example, right now, it's 71,000 uh, articles from which the information in MetaPsych has, is, has been derived. Another statistic that we cite is our curators spend a lot of time writing what we call mini review summaries or comments about pathways, proteins, reactions, metabolites. And so we can sum up the total amount of text in those many review summaries. Uh, and that's another metric that we use. So for example, for MetaPsych right now, it contains the equivalent of 10,000 textbook pages 
of these mini review summaries. Uh, so that's another thing that we use in both grant proposals and in trying to communicate to new users how much information is in our database. But I think I think that's a I'd be curious to hear what other me metrics other folks use on capturing the amount of information because. For example, for users, they're not really used to being to considering that dimension, I think. And there's probably not a standard way of communicating how much information is in this new database. And also trying to separate things like the genome sequence that you may have actually imported from another database from the actual curated information that your project has added that adds real value to other imported data. I mean, we can supply that information because everything in Uniplot is increasingly evidence tagged. Um, and particularly in grant applications and grant reports, that's more when we use that sort of very technical data, uh, sort of data, uh, you know, paper count and, and entries that we've moved from Tremble into Swissprot. Um, as you say, imported data, how many cross reference we've added, that sort of thing. That's not, I don't think that's particularly interesting to your average biologist who in nine times out of 10 probably doesn't even know what you're talking about. Um, but it is the sort of thing that grant authorities or people who are, you know, who are watching whether you've fulfilled your metrics over a five year period or whatever uh, do care about. So that sort of data we would very much regard as, as more reporting data rather than something that we would use as a hook to bring new users in. New users want something sexier. They want a story. They want something that they get interested in. They want to know what you've done with their protein, not with the other hundreds of millions of proteins. Um, so they want something much more individualistic. In fact, most of them would really like you to write a little summary of just that relates directly to their work. Obviously, they're not going to get that, but it's finding a way of portraying that sort of personal interest to an individual per, uh, uh, researcher to pull them in. Um, that we're constantly looking for. I think so, it depends on the database. Um, for example, for the LitCovid database that we automatically created, we do have sort of statistics like how many um, papers on COVID-19 are in this collection. Um, how many do we have, um, like we detect of these in uh, per their publication date. So you can see a graph growing from the, the time that uh, COVID-19 was first detected up to, up to now. You can see the cumulative number of these articles. You can see um, the regions of the world that they uh, are published from or they talk about. Um, so this gives like a different bird, bird's eye view on the data on what this collection contains. And then we have our own methods that we work on it. Like well, we, we have, can group these articles based on what, whether they talk about diagnosis or whether they talk about mechanism of the disease or whether they talk about treatment of the disease and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I think uh, as we go into detail on what kind of database we're talking about, those metrics start to become a little bit more, um, more specific and certain metrics may matter more for a particular kind of data versus the other. Okay, we have a question in the chat by Emmanuel Pute. He asks if it would be a good idea to alert uh, authors when their publications are integrated into a database after bio curation. In fact, the intact well, the IMEX uh, inter molecular interaction databases do this. They grab the uh, email address from the publication and then with every release, send out a form, mess uh, a structured message just saying your paper has been integrated. Please take a look and feedback. And they get about, I would say about 10% of the papers, they'll get some sort of feedback. Sometimes it's just, thanks for doing this. Didn't even know you existed. I'll look at you in the future. And sometimes it's really useful, like you've made a mistake or, there's some more data that we didn't publish. Would you be interested in this? So, um, it, yeah, it's a useful exercise, but it is quite a lot of work. 
So we do that uh, in Uniprot, but it's for the community annotation. So basically these are not necessarily authors, but people who add publications and annotations um, to Uniprot. And this is a, a separate section from the Uniprot curation, but it adds a lot of value information. And we use ORCID, I see a question about ORCID as well, ORCID's based link to the publication. Um, we use ORCID to add, give attribute uh, for the curation uh, for people who uh, do this. And we um, send email back to them, communicate back to mention when the information shows on the database. I mean, in terms of on the website. I'm not sure how you would automatically find create ORCID based links because you can't get work work IDs from PubMed, can you? I'm not sure how you do that. Uh, I, they, what we do is they have to sign in to uh, in order to validate who they are to to add the publications and annotations. That's how they do. It's it's a proact it's a, a kind of community active activity on annotation. Okay, so you have the authors add their ORC IDs to an entry. Yes, so what they do, what they do is they uh, sign in with ORCID and then um, they add whatever PubMed ID. And it's not necessarily the author of the paper. It could be a domain expert or a student who knows about this paper and knows that it belongs to this protein and has pro provides information about function. So they would add that information. And we show it in a spe special place where it's community curation on, in the entry. Okay, we may move to, to the next topic. It's about splitting the database that you can cite different parts of it. So for example, how does Uniprod does it? And, and uh, do, do we have to assign DOIs or anything to specific part of the database so people can cite special uh, ways or how, how could you do that? Right. Uh, there are some, some of the large submission databases I could see that would work for uh, because you're dealing with a single large data set. So it, uh, for instance, Pride does this a lot where proteomics data sets are deposited and then people take that data set and reanalyze them. Um, and they, I think, I'm not sure whether they use DOIs or just a link out, but anyway, they, uh, they have an attribution uh, mechanism for that particular data set. Um, for a database like Uniprot, where we're reading the papers and, and synthesizing the information and putting that back into the entry, that's a much more difficult proposition. Um, obviously, we have to attribute data that we import, and we're increasingly bringing particularly the data you access through the API. It can be large data sets, and in that case, it, you can trace it back to the author or to the submission or to the database that uh, have given it. Um, but actually sort of saying this came from the subcellular location part of a, a traditional Uniprot entry would be difficult, I think. Um, it can actually be done from the URL, but it's not the sort of thing I think most uh, papers, for instance, would be interested in, in putting in as a link. Um, but certainly, the, uh, if you just want to uh, attribute a specific part of a specific protein entry, you can do it through the URL. But as I say, it's it's a bit of an unwieldy method, I would say. Well, for so other, think, uh, yeah. yeah, because it's saying various databases, resources. So, uh, sorry, it's uh, how Unipro does it. So we have, uh, if it's about a specific part of the one database uh, that's, I agree with Sandra, <laughs> I, but um, Univer has several databases and there's, we have publications specific for uh, each of those. So we, those could be cited as needed, but yes, for, for parts of it right now, well, we don't have a, a specific way to do it. I could circle back on the ORCID ID comment from Peter earlier. PubMed does provide the ORCID ID, but not for all papers. It's a, it's a recent addition and depends on, because PubMed receives the data from the publishers. If the publishers have the 
author's ORCID ID, then they report it to PubMed and this part of the metadata that um, people can find from PubMed. I actually uh, would urge all our viewership to really use their ORCID ID. It's incredibly helpful for author name disambiguation, among other things. So yeah, for those papers that ORCID ID is present, a lot more other things are even are, are easier to process. Yeah, interesting point. Um, go, going back to the late, the other topic, um, in in BioPsych, you know, some people think of BioPsych as a database, but we really think of it as a collection of databases, one per organism, one per sequence genome. So we now have over 19,000 databases and separating biopsych into separate databases per organism is extremely helpful for, for many different reasons. Um, it does enable crediting and attribution of who was involved in curating that database, but it also enables an organism specific view of the data and searches of the data. So when someone searches biopsych for say a protein or a pathway or a gene name, they're only searching within one database. There's a notion of a current database, a current organism that's been selected and all searches go against that one database. Now, more recently, we've added the ability to define a database set. So for example, if I wanna search three different strains of E. coli to see what pathways they contain or what metabolites they contain, you can do a multi-database search. You can also search across all of BioPsych using certain tools as well. But really our primary search mechanisms are per, per organism. And I think that's what most scientists want. I think most scientists, most of the time, not all the time, there's certainly times when you wanna query, say all proteins in the world as, as Uniprot enables. Um, but most of the time, I think our users want to query on a per organism basis. Uh, so that that decomposition, I think, has has served our users very well. Okay, so now we have next topic. Topic would be about uh, licensing. So we have uh, many different licenses available. Uh, most known is Creative Commons, we also license for, for software. So what would be the best license? What does mean uh, non-commercial or, or anything like that? What are you using for your, uh, your resource, for example? Well, uh, I, I can guess the reason there are so many possibilities at the moment are there are so many funding models out there and to a large extent which license you select is very much driven by your funding mo model if you're lucky to be fully funded then you can make your data cc0 or uh, whatever uh, open source model you want to follow um, but for uh, and if you're a large database then the uh, adding the the fact that you want the attribution is possibly a little bit less important but if you're a very small database or a very new database, then probably people would much prefer to select the, uh, that they request that people attribute or any day reuse so that they get that publicity, they get that uh, visibility. Of course, it's very difficult to enforce. Um, I, I can't think of a single case where I've ever heard of a database taking someone to court because they haven't attributed them on their data, uh, but it's there at least as a request. Um, so I think the bigger databases, the better funded databases, and hopefully as a result of uh, some of the work we're going to hear on later, that then as funding becomes more stable, then databases will be able to increasingly move towards a, a CC0 license, a, a completely free and open source license. Um, but I think under the fund, current funding model, uh, that's going to be difficult for uh, many other, for many of the current um, resources out there, and I think they're forced by their funding model to go for more restrictive licenses. Yeah, it, it also depends, I, I guess, on if you have a resource that integrates a lot of data from several resources, you have kind of follow, be mindful of the licenses they have, 
because you cannot um, use CC zero if some of them have some restrictions. So we have that. That's another uh, limitation. Uh, but again, you can decide when you distribute the data to uh, remove that uh, source if that if you want to um, if you want to disseminate or or make it public at least the the things that you can. About um, the graphical representation of data that you have in many databases, when people want to use that in a publication or something, do you think CC0 could be good or at least a CC by? That's possibly one uh, reason for CC by, but again, it's, it, depend, it, it depends really, I suppose, but they've clipped the, the actual, so, uh, to take the obvious uh, example, the Swiss biopic pics of the cell, uh, which Philippe, for those who don't know, <laughs> produces. Um, if they've clipped that directly from the Uniprot entry and re-show it in uh, a paper, I think we would be quite upset if there wasn't some acknowledgement of the work that you've done to produce those. Um, part of that's just good manners, to be perfectly honest. I don't know, we are uh, um, unlikely to sue, as I said before, but um, you do expect that people would attribute it. Uh, and maybe that's sort of a step beyond the standard curation, and, and maybe that is something you would want to think of putting a little bit more protection on. Um, but at the same point, uh, you know, on the, the flip side of that is that we are funded to be a completely public resource. So um, we make the data public. We can't stop people from using it. We don't want to stop people from using it. We want to encourage that. Uh, and restrictive licensing does put people off. Um, so yes, I haven't got an easy answer to that one. Okay, so we could move to the next topic, which is the versioning. So how to stop different versions of, of your data, if you want to, and where uh, could you store data for, for a long time? So I've seen an example back, Zenodo, Figshare, AWS, and so on. So what about versioning and storing data or version for a long time? Sorry, I seem to be doing all the talking at the moment, but I think that's very much driven by the, um, the support you have behind you. So if you have a big institute like uh, the EBI or the SID behind you, then you can, store data, uh, data as you can store various, several versions, maybe even all the versions of your database because you've got the compute power to do that. Again, it's one of those things that for new databases, small resources um, and, and standalone resources that are just operating out of somebody's uh, lab or somebody's office, um, then that's very difficult because they just don't have the compute to uh, enable them to do it. it. It's not a trivial exercise. They're managing the versions and making all those versions accessible to people. Um, well, you can't really store, this. yeah, I can see the question. You can't really store a database on Figshare or, you know, the, these are, uh, they're, these are uh, resources for a specific use and their use is not storing a huge relation or even a small relational database. Um, so. It, yeah, it however, <laughs> yeah. However, the text mining corpora, a lot of them, uh, we do provide those data sets. Uh, we have a biocreative uh, in Zenodo. It's not complete yet because we, we are moving, we have to move things, but we are, um, we do have a biocreative website with the corpora that has been used um, in the text mine annotated that has been used in all the challenge and is kind of the baseline for many of, of the um, uh, methodologies that are being developed. And we, um, we have some of those moved to Zenodo as, as part of archiving those. Um, but uh, that's the experience I have so far. <laughs> For, 
can can I go back can I go back for a moment to the more general issue this panel is concerned with, which is promoting databases, how to reach new users, and so forth. And I'd, I'd like to make maybe a controversial statement, which is that maybe there are too many databases, like way too many databases. Maybe there are too many databases for scientists to keep track of, for even us in the field to keep track of, to be taught. <clears throat> maybe there are too many databases for to reasonably teach students about. Um, maybe we've been so successful in some sense that we just have too many databases for anyone to remember or for anyone to understand this space. And I think it may be partly due to the funding agencies that, of course, they want to make everyone happy and spread their money as thinly as they possibly can so that everybody has their own database and gets credit for it. Um, but maybe from a promotional point of view, for example, it's just impossible for a new database to get Mindshare. And maybe we should be thinking about new models where, for example, maybe a number of new databases that get started maybe shouldn't be started as new databases. Maybe they should be somehow partnerships with existing databases in some way. Because existing databases, for example, have huge promotional capabilities in terms of email lists that they've built up over the years, social media channels that they've built up. And for example, if I was to partner with Unipro, they could help me promote my new database in some way. Uh, or maybe it's a new section of Unipro, for example, just, just to use Unipro as an example. Um, rather than force every database to build up their own email list and write their own scripts for doing emailing to their users and so forth. Um, so Peter, I think uh, I, I agree with Peter Wood's comments that few databases actually get funding and many of them have, uh, there are many databases, but there's lack of funding as well for the ones that are, <laughs> I mean, the significant ones, or at least that can show that uh, those are being used. I don't know. I. I, I I do see the point of uh, trying to collaborate with existing databases. It's the same like in ontologies, you have this uh, ontology space where you try to have one ontology for each uh, domain uh, part, right? So, uh, and they tried not to overlap. So there's the Obo Foundry that tried to do that. So it's, it's a good concept, but um, I, I don't know how it would work. The thing is that we need, we still, I don't want the message that there's a lot of money for databases and they're giving all the way because it's not really true, I guess. Uh, I mean, you, you brought two partner with databases. So we've done it with RIA, yeah. we've done it with the, the, the IMEX databases. We're doing it with the complex portal moving forward. Yeah. Uh, and it is a successful model and we can't hold all the data. We can't process all the data. Um, it's really, you know, we need those partner resources. And as new data types come along, I mean, imaging obviously is the flavor of the month at the moment. There are new imaging databases popping up all over the place. Um, we'll take the creme de la creme, tip of the iceberg, the, one, <laughs> the, the ones that can actually present data in a format we can use and, and show and move our, uh, our resource forward. Um, but we do need that. We need certainly a, a turnover of new databases just to capture the new data types. I, I oh, good point. Actually, I hadn't I hadn't hadn't thought about those partnerships you do have. That I hadn't mm -hmm. thought of them that way. That's a really good point. <laughs> That's very much why we set them up because they're specialists. So you know the Proteome Exchange are specialists in proteomics. So they take in the data, they process it. And then feed us the processed peptides, and they'll be doing sending us po uh, post translational modifications soon. We couldn't set up that pipeline. We haven't the expertise, and we certainly haven't got the bandwidth that Uniprops uh, hold the immense amount of data that a proteomics database needs to hold with. Similarly, at the IMX databases, they're the experts in interactions. Uh, so we, we use that expertise, and, and uh, you know, we gain from it those partnerships. So in that in that line of thought, not only other databases, how they help each other because they are processing data in a different way and they are enriching the information that way, but also bringing in 
uh, developers and machine learning people, I think the key here is to make the data the data format easy or shareable and accessible in a well documented format, so that um, people can can uh, can be attracted to come and use this data and process it and make it uh, shareable and accessible, so that different databases can communicate with each other and uh, contribute to each other. Yeah, and we try to make it very clear we're only holding a very small subset. So we, you know, the the, the way the, the relationship is two ways. We're also directing people back out to those resources if they want the detail, if they want all them, the metadata, um, they want to download the data in the appropriate format. We wouldn't uh, expect them to do that at Uniprop. We would expect proteomic scientists to go back to Pride, to Dam or, or whichever you know Peptide Atlas and and download in the appropriate. Uh, format that's right for that community. We we just show the the little subset they or relatively small subset they send to us. It's a two way working relationship. It has to be. <laughs> we had two questions in the chat about uh, uh, description of database landscape. So some people, for example, ask is wondering what are the ongoing efforts of cataloging available databases. Is there a place or some way to, to get access to pretty much all the databases? Well, the NAR, the, the NAR uh, annual uh, kind, they do have catalogs of the data, different types of databases that are out there, right? I think they do collect those. Uh, at, at least every time I'm looking for a new kind of uh, databases or so, I, I go to the uh, nucleolysis research uh, journal a special uh, issue and look at their uh, they have 17 categories of type of databases and i check there uh, to see what is new or, or what it's defunct <laughs> that's yeah, one uh, there's a yeah there are, there's the elixir uh, catalogs give you the across europe picture i guess chuck is going to talk more about the global picture and i presume that is something that is going to eventually come out of the uh, global biodata coalition um, but that's looking forward, obviously, at the moment. But Elixir certainly exists now, so if you want to know what the situation is in Europe, I would go to the uh, Elixir pages. What about my more general point that we have too many databases? Do people agree with that? Uh, which, ones, which ones are you volunteering to close down? So you're 19,000. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, maybe we're the worst offender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing we're work that the EBI is actively working on is the sort of management life, managing the life cycle, because some databases do come to a natural end. So Array Express will not be, uh, will be uh, closing in the foreseeable future. We're not going to throw the data away, but it's no longer, you know, the, the, the technology has moved on. So the requirement isn't there for that original database. We now have more sophisticated uh, ways of storing the same data. Um, so it, it's something you have to think of, and it's better to have a managed end than just fizzle out because you've run out of funding and um, a lot of frustrated users are getting upset because you haven't updated for six years and the website's not really working anymore and the download has corrupted two years ago, but there isn't a developer to fix it. So it, it's better to have to manage, to pass the data on to somebody who can look after it maybe. Um, than, than to, as I say, to die slowly and horribly. So we're but, talking about the future. What is the future of databases and what is the future of manual curation? Yeah, I'm, I'm partly asking, can we afford to be, is it reasonable to constantly be creating new databases? Um, and is it, too hard to find mindshare for for new new databases in some very specialized area. Well, but do we mentioned... know do we know that there is a database increase in terms of uh, new databases over the years? Or I mean, we we have to probably do some research there because maybe I mean there are a lot of databases, but many many of those are not maintained. They are like historical, or they you cannot even access. We don't know what is the pace of new databases these days. 
Probably true. Uh, something that Peter mentioned earlier about sending those frequent emails to their users with little educational tidbits, like, did you know how to do this? And this is something that you can do with this database. Um, seems like those are important um, ways to bring back the knowledge that people are forgetting, for example, as um, with information overload. Yeah, and it's something that works great on uh, social media as well. You can do little uh, tweetorials, is the, is the buzzword at the moment, but little videos that just show somebody how to, you know, use the advanced search or uh, access a particular data type within a, a longer record. So um, that's one way you certainly can creatively and successfully use social media. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice idea. So one thing that I wanted to mention uh, that it has to do with dissemination of, of uh, the bio-curation and making how important it is uh, to, to make people aware of that. Um, I think it is very important that uh, bio-curators are involved in review of publications. They are involved in uh, panels, in advisory boards, and in, in, especially in funding agencies, if possible, to in review panels because we need to have a voice there or response to the um, request for information from NIH many times they submit this request for information for specific topics and I know ISB has been active in the past to to answer those um, I think it's important that we become involved not only doing our curation little our curation job but also um, talking or being involved in the process of the of reviewing uh, because that educates help to educate the community in, in some way in, in addition to the other things we mentioned in terms of teaching webinars and training okay we have just a few minutes um so there's a, a question related to the topic is about outreach strategies what the value of doing webinars, training courses, conference, is it worth it to, to promote a database? Yes. <laughs> yes, all of them. Yeah. I mean, if you uh, webinars are great because you hit such a big audience yeah. and then you can put the recording on, uh, somewhere accessible and hit many thousands more. Uh, that's something that's really come out of the pandemic um, and certainly moving forward we will reduce our face-to-face -face because it just they're just so intense on time um, whereas a webinar you can shoot in the comfort of your back bedroom or you know in your office at work yeah. um, and meet and, and access so many more people we're not going to stop face-to-face -face. I mean that has real advantages as well but uh, it, it, there's no way it meets the same number of people that uh, and any mini that. and any mini video to doing some tutorial or showing uh, the back the backstage of curation are would also be I think it's very helpful as well not only showing what your resource does but sometimes um, shows how you get there right how you for example do uniproc curation you showing that to the community shows the value of a paper why a paper is added to unipro they would understand that concept and and maybe be more mindful that they if they add an identifier or that would be useful could be added to the database and write it. a better paper you mean <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and the value of the data that is produced by expert biocuration scientists, because for medically relevant information, you cannot outsource easily, or you cannot do like Amazon Turk or, or other uh, curation efforts. And with that lull in the conversation, I just want to remind uh, everyone we've got about one minute left for the discussion, and then we've got to introduce the next bit of the, the conference. So maybe, Philip, if you've got some final remarks. I think we have, we have raised a lot of interesting topics there. Uh, we have just a, a quick question to Peter. So about too many databases. We think in the past, databases on the long term have tends to 
to go in consortium like for PDB, INSDC, Uniprot? Do you think it could be a trend to, to move forward and reduce the number of databases? Oh, to have kind of international collaborations? Yeah, consortium that all database putting together to, to, to work at, at once. I don't know. It would be interesting to share how well those consortia have worked. That that's certainly one that would be one approach. But I mean, overall, I yeah, I was suggesting kind of that new database efforts should perhaps would would maybe find it easier to team up with an existing database in some way. That that would at least be one model. And maybe the international consortia is is one way to implement that model of teaming up, but there are probably other ways to team up with databases as well. Okay, thank you. I think minute is finished. Charlie? So, thank you, Philip, for sharing this session to our panelists. If there are unanswered questions in our chat, maybe you can keep on interacting with uh, our panelists uh, during the break uh, or also after. We now have a break of uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, and then we will uh, get back for the uh, full invited speaker talks uh, chaired by Sushma Naitani and uh, we are going to talk about uh, um, structures, RNA and the Global Biodata Coalition. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. And if you want to stay or you want to interact with us, please uh, raise your hands. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for all the panelists. Nice discussion. I see that we have a raised hand. Sorry, word. You're allowed to talk now if you want. Oh, sorry, that was not for this session. I, I expected that you will send me a link to the next session if I raise my hand. But stay hello, here. everyone, anyway. <laughs> I'll stay here. <laughs> I'd like to actually pick up with the number of the databases and the database landscape that we have. And uh, it was interesting that we do have a huge inventory in NAR about the databases, but then there are many, many small databases that never published in NAR or database, for example. And people have actually made those databases in their own labs and perhaps published or mentioned at part of the research manuscript. So, some of those, for example, I can think of uh, many proteomics groups uh, who have cataloged the proteins from, say, different plant organelles, mitochondria, chloroplasts, different plasma membrane. And uh, they have the database maintained at their own labs. So there are many, many different things. People have curated protein databases, a fraction of those almost from each. Uh, each species sometimes broader, sometimes focused on the mechanisms and so on. And so it, it's kind of, you know, uh, perhaps interesting that uh, we could uh, have some kind of ways where people can uh, provide that inputs and there could be some cataloging and thinking about uh, what has been deactivated, what is current, what somebody has hoped to develop for, what can be taken by the bigger databases, so that that data is not lost. Uh, can I respond to that? Yeah, sure, please. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about this in my about the the number of databases when I talk. Um, we're doing an inventory to try to understand how many there are in the world. Um, it's not the focus of my talk today. Uh, mostly because we don't have any results yet. But um, we are trying to count how many they are. And that is, that is the first step in understanding whether there are too many. There are, very, there are certainly a, very, a lot. Um, whether there are too many is not something I would hazard to 
to, to make a judgment on now because we don't know what they look like. But there are some, some considerations here. Um, most, many of the data resources are connected to each other as Sandra alluded to. Um, so they're, they're even a resource that a database that looks like it's not very important and small is, pro is probably and quite likely to be feeding to the information to larger data resources. So the data in that very small data resource ends up being findable through other places, uh, which may amplify its usefulness and utility and the, its user base. Um, it's hard to track that, but but there isn't a big infrastructure. There's an infrastructure of interconnectedness, and it's 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 difficult to tease out um, what's where are the important ones and what are the what is important and what's not important and even to define what is important um and as but as you as you mentioned there are many databases which are not findable if they, if they haven't published something um it's probably not going to be it's going to be difficult to identify and find it for people who don't directly know the creator of the database um yeah so i'll talk more about that well very briefly about that um when i when i when i talk but we will uh, talk about the results of the inventory project uh, whenever when it's done which will be later this year we think um so we'll, we'll publish a paper and 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 talk about other other aspects of it thanks so i i just wanted to add a, a point from a younger scientist um People need to make their careers doing interesting things. And uh, I don't know if there's a lot of places where people made a huge contribution to a, a big database that's already established where they, they then wrote the paper about that. So uh, and, until there's a, a better way to deal with publishing and funding, let's say, yeah, it's it doesn't sound so great if you want to get funding to make meaningful contributions to Uniprot or to EcoPsych. But if you want to build up your own new database, it's it's got your institution's name on it. Well, maybe you get funding for that instead. So, yeah, there's there's definitely like maybe an experience and a um, yeah, you know, like scientific career progression perspective to that question as well. I, I agree. I mean, I think those are really important considerations. Um, but at the same time, if if it's impossible to get mind share for a new database, um, is, is that a good thing? Um, but I agree that promotion and funding priorities um, make it difficult to go that route. And I, I remember 10, 15 years ago, NIH was funding three different E. coli databases, I think in part because they saw it as important for the PIs of each database to get credit from their institutions for that work. So how, how can we, yet I, I don't think it was really serving the E. coli community to have three places to have to search for given information and not know who might have the most up-to-date information. So is that, is that really a good model? And there is still the, op uh, the option of, of starting your database, but joining an ex uh, uh, collaboration. Um, to give it longer term stability. So the IMX consortium has, has kept some of the interaction databases going through fallow periods. Um, and then they've managed to get funding and restarted. So DIP, for instance, went through several years where it had absolutely no funding whatsoever. I'm not quite sure what it's got, what it's got now, but then got an NIH grant uh, and managed to get going again. But in the meantime, the data had been maintained and looked, and looked after because it was part of um, IMEX. And, new databases have come along and joined and, ha and had a same level of support. Proteome Exchange does the same for protein, uh, proteomics databases, helps new, new databases get start, set up and join the community. Uh, so um, there is a sort of compromise, if you like, a, a way that you can both create your own space, but also be part of the bigger whole as well, if you're in an area where that sort of collaboration has been built, or if you can push your area of interest into building a similar sort of collaboration. So that's a model that people can consider. Yeah, and actually I'll give another example of a similar model, which is we're actually collaborating with Marcus Covert's group at Stanford, who works on this E. coli whole cell model to integrate 
um, results from the model into EcoPsych. And we're essentially we're using, to a large degree, we're using the EcoPsych website as a um, distribution channel for data produced from the whole cell model. Marcus has separate funding from NIH to develop his model um, and to add this distribution channel to EcoPsych. So he does get the funding credit and he'll get credit for this kind of distinct new channel within EcoPsych. So I think that's an example similar to what Sandra was raising of an effort that can have its own identity, but also still be take advantage of the larger resource. For so, for example, we'll be helping, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be promoting this new functionality within EcoPsych, but crediting Marcus's group for um, the work they've contributed. That was a really nice follow-up discussion, but uh, I'm gonna cut everyone off right there because it's time for us to get going again. So let's let Fede give her um, yeah. opening remarks for the next session. So now we are going to move on with the invited speaker talks. And uh, the session is chaired by Sushma. Uh, each talk has uh, 12 minutes longer. And uh, then we have three, que uh, three minutes uh, for questions after each talk. So please, Sushma. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. So today we have four talks. And the first talk is from Bastien Fromm. He's a group leader at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. And his group focuses on microRNA evolution and animal complexity. Uh, they have curated a microRNA gene database known as MirGeneDB. Uh, so here uh, I invite, well, I welcome and invite uh, Dr. Fromm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Yeah, um, so uh, very interesting uh, discussion. And actually the story of my talk is the story of every single point you just raised. Too many databases, cooperate or not, funding or not. So the title of my uh, presentation can read um, uh, is attempting to uh, get a renaissance for microni research. Uh, which is the core of my uh, research activities in my lab. And just a brief introduction, Micronics were discovered in 93 uh, in a worm in C. elegans, uh, of course, and uh, they are small non-coding gene regulators. They are very important developmental regulators and involved in timing and uh, target is particularly the free PPG also of protein coding genes. They are also very deeply conserved in all animals, which was found in 2000 and 2001. And uh, this makes them uh, very interesting for phylogenetic and evolutionary questions. And indeed, there was a couple of uh, very uh, landmark papers that used microRNAs to resolve phylogenetic relationships of until then uh, uh, enigmatic uh, organisms or relationships. However, on the right, you can see um, this phylogenetic tree, a simplified tree of all animals. And these yellow dots here show all the open uh, questions and the open relationships that are not clear and have not been looked at with microRNAs. Now, microRNAs are extensively studied. In fact, last year I saw a new record with over 16,000 microRNA uh, related papers. So the term microRNA in title or abstract of the publication. And we know now a lot about uh, their biogenesis. So there is a problem and there's actually several or at least there were. And this is that we know a lot about the microRNAs and their biogenesis. And these, all these features, this criteria for annotation of microRNAs can actually quite easily implemented in bioinformatics uh, tools. However, um, it was 2003, so this is pre-NGS time when these criteria, uh, the widely used criteria were, were applied, uh, set up, established, and uh, also when uh, MIR-based micron database repository, I would say, uh, came into being. 
Now, the problem with this uh, is that it, it is kind of organically uh, grown and then a lot of micron A's in, in, uh, in the same, in different organisms, the, the same genes had totally different names. Also, uh, the micron A they, database then was riddled with a lot of false positives. Some of them have been actually corrected by the uh, database itself, but most not. So this led then here in this histogram simplified to actually quite heterogenic uh, micron A complements between closely related organisms. And the uh, utility of micron A for phylogenetic purposes was questioned. Now, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the most fitting uh, photographs of bio curation uh, from a natural history museum. It's also, I do actually work in a, a natural history museum. And as for these beetles and other organisms, uh, of course, gene repositories and uh, databases, as you all are really aware of, need curation. And this is what we did then in 2015. We established uh, a, or collected and established a set of criteria for the annotation of microRNAs and applied it to four uh, species. Um, and uh, in uh, our first version of the database, MirGeneDB. And this is in close collaboration with Kevin Peterson and Bartman. We uh, then set out and expanded the database um, to 45 uh, uh, different animal species representing many, many important groups and further improved our annotation and nomenclature. And I want to highlight here uh, this comparison in the next slide. So while this is here, the state, where you can here see human and macaque and all these animals, and they are quite different uh, in terms of gene and family numbers in, in the mere based data repository. Uh, after our curation effort, um, it looked uh, much, much, much more similar. So closely related species are uh, very similar in their micron A complements effect. And this is then just uh, out now really in, uh, also we used our database issue uh, for now, um, when we expanded it further to more organisms and uh, further improved the uh, annotation uh, um, system. Now, what can we do with this? Of course, first of all, we can actually build a tree. And this is very important uh, to show this, that we can build a full metazone tree just based on the sequences of microRNAs, which is totally coherent with what many people agree on, most experts. And we can also identify evolutionary boosts of microRNA evolution spanning in total 750 million years of evolution, which is the core of my research interest. We can then ask, for instance, copy number evolution in organisms, expansion of particular gene families. And um, this is uh, going to far now for, to go into the details, just a few examples. But most importantly, and uh, we touched upon this uh, in the discussion, uh, is we can apply this now, because it is a very good database and manually created, actually. We can apply this now to machine learning. And, try to understand, uh, uh, create models um, to predict micron A's in genomes. And what uh, we do here is um, uh, we have a tool called Mir Machine, where we essentially train our uh, tool on the micron A complements of these organisms to be curated, and then use sequence and structural information for covariance models that we train then in our database. Uh, for cutoffs and then uh, apply them. And we are doing this at the moment in, in collaboration with RefSeq and our ensemble. This tool will be implemented in their annotation pipeline soon. And uh, we are working on, on a release in the next two months. My lab is uh, here at, uh, located at the museum in, in Troms in Norway. And we are actually using microRNAs to uh, look at animal evolution, what I just showed you, but also to study uh, uh, single cell uh, interactions of gene regulatory networks and also paleo and transcriptomics, which is we use microRNAs and ancient uh, samples to determine tissue and taxonomic origin of samples. And the, what we will be doing is to look at all these big question marks in green. We have already added these organisms and we are going to do this in the next few years 
to, to solve the tree of life, we hope. Um, with this coming to the acknowledgement, funding, collaborators, and I would like to thank you and hope you have questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so please, uh, you can type your questions in Q&A or in the chat. So I, I like your cartoon, a little cartoon, who want to do bio-curation, uh, sorry, who want to do machine learning, who wants to give data, and then who wants to label the data. And I think this is the question that we have very few bio-curators, and especially from the community, uh, there is little help. Did uh, you so have any... No, so, so we, we, we uh, this is why I mentioned it was uh, uh, the discussion was so great because we had actually have no funding for the database itself. This is something that we do through our projects and can actually cover it. But we were also dependent on the European bioinformatics um, collaboration, you can say the Elixir um, initiative that helped us uh, with uh, actually informaticians to set up a proper database, um, which is not so so easy as many people think at least what i thought and um of course also to maintain and, and expand it but uh, all these machine learning approaches um uh, that are now happening really at a high pace uh, we tried this of course in comparison to the existing repositories that were full of false positives and this is then uh, problematic because the accuracy and the um yeah, the predictive power of these uh, machine learning tools are then very low, depending on what you feed them with. We have a question uh, from Mike uh, Livston. How do you account for structural and sequence non-specific elements of microRNA in your evolutionary trees? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but um, what we essentially do for uh, our alignments is we uh, take uh, family-based uh, uh, alignments, so one micron family at a time for each organism. And given that uh, the curation efforts from uh, for our database include actually synthetic information, so we will know which paralog uh, uh, is an orthologue to another organism. So we have actually quite accurate uh, alignments. And obviously, if loops, loop sequences are varying, then they will be phylogenetically not informative, but, uh, yeah, excluded from the analysis. I have one more question. I think we have time. Uh, so any would like anyone else like to ask? Uh, if not, I just have a question interested to our work. Have you seen any conservation of microanimates between plants and animals? Are there any no. ancestral? This is, uh, this is um, uh, a bit debated at the moment, but um, I, in, in my book, they have nothing to do with your job. So this is just my take. There are other opinions out there. There's certainly no con conservation. I mean, even in very... Uh, basal organisms such as sponges, um, you don't, they have microRNAs, but they are not conserved in our animals. We have time for a few more questions, actually. <laughs> we have another two minutes, a little bit here. Yeah. If not, then please feel free to type your question in chat and uh, Bastian will be happy to answer that. And I would like to welcome our next speaker, Eduardo Saladini. Uh, yes. He's with... Hi. Yeah, welcome. Um, Eduardo is a structural biologist and currently he's a bio-curator of Protein Ensemble Database and Distraught. Uh, his focus is on intrinsically disordered protein. And here you go, Eduardo. Uh, so, no, not this one. So, yes, sure. Here. Uh, can you see my presentation and my screen? Yes. We can, Edu. Yeah. Yes. 
That's perfect. So thank you very much for the nice presentation and thank you very much for allowing me to present this topic here. Uh, <clears throat> so I would like to present uh, indeed uh, the protein ensemble database, uh, in particular what we are going on with this, but how, how, how we plan to continue this, to expand this database. So first of all, uh, just uh, a few so this is, first of all, the home page of this database. So the Protein Ensemble database is an open access database and it is collecting uh, intrinsic disorder ensembles. And I will explain briefly what, what are those ensembles. Uh, the, the, the work um, that is describing the database is published, it was published in our in 2001, 2021. And there is also a protocol published. Um, First of all, uh, I, I would like to say something about an IDP, so intrinsic disorder proteins in general. So this is uh, an example of globular protein. You are probably used to see this kind of uh, this kind of representation. The problem, and, and this is what is deposited actually in PDB right now. And what you can see for IDPs is, is this kind of behavior. So uh, intrinsic disorder protein doesn't have one single conformation, but they can assume different conformation in solution depending on the context mainly. Uh, this is important because of course, the function related to uh, this protein, these regions or this protein is related also to the conformation and possible conformation they can assume. And there are actually, so those are kind of examples or are some of the examples. So the, these IDPs can fold upon binding like in this case, or, and can bind different kind of uh, surface or macromolecules or lipids or whatever. And they can also assume, so they, the disorder itself can, can be used as a, can, can be the, the um, can cause the function at least. And this is the example of this channel here that you can see. So where the disorder can open or the disorder region can uh, assume conformation, and open, different conformation and open and close the channel. And the, in solution, and you can see that those proteins can change conformation. This is an example here of high-speed atomic force microscopy. It's a global protein, the, the sphere there, but there is a small tail that is moving in solution. And you can also describe that in molecular dynamics. And this is an example of uh, like a phase separation. Um, and so that's why we cannot, uh, characterize them with a single structure, but we need to use an ensemble of different conformers to, uh, to describe them. And that's where uh, the protein ensemble database is, 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 is helping us. So we are actually depositing uh, ensembles, so different conformation for a single uh, protein uh, that that protein can assume. Um, so this is an example on the on the on the left, but uh, I will give you some example more some example later. Uh, this is just to explain so to show you that uh, uh, we can discriminate between the ensemble deposit in the database because of course these proteins can assume different conformation, can be more compact or extended. Uh, extended and in this plot you can see the uh, uh, how many kind of uh, how many uh, um, conform how many different kind of conformation you can see at, in uh, in relationship with the length of the single protein and here you can find the statistic uh, the it's updated to the uh, last month and uh, you can see that we have currently uh, 200 uh, different entries and so 200 different ensembles um this is what you can see if you open a browse page and for each single uh, protein you have a uniprot identifier a pad identifier the title of this and the experimental tag because uh what i didn't mention is that all the ensemble in this database uh um, are need to be characterized by experimental uh, and experimental techniques and those these are the examples so it cannot be only molecular simulation but molecular dynamics but it has to be some experimental uh, outcome and some experimental data and every single uh, ensemble has a proper number of conformations that are describing this ensemble uh, these are this is a specific example. So how it's uh, display in uh, in PED. 
So every uh, entry has uh, the, their own owners, publication um, by creators. So it's uh, the, the material that is deposited in PED has to be published or has to be in, uh, in, in press. But uh, uh, we are uh, also asking to um, the data owners to give us some ensembles and we can just put them on hold and until, until the uh, publication is not uh, released. And there are details about how the um, ensemble is generated and some statistic of those ensembles, as you can see here. And we are now relying on the IDP ontology because there is no ontology that can describe until now that can describe this kind of information. But we are trying to move into some uh, uh, bigger and let's say more stable ontology like the ECO, uh, like evidence and conclusion ontology, uh, at least for the experimental methods. Um, and now I would like to give you some, a couple of examples to show you why we need this and how can you use that. So this is an example. Uh, it's pretty recent. And this ensemble is the ensemble of this HNRMP A1 protein. And this was made using NMR, SAX, and EPR. Those are the techniques that are used to uh, create the the ensemble and in particular the ensemble calculation was made try, uh, starting from a PDB structure and calculating the conformers using this package. But you are not interested on that probably. So these are more details that you can find in the database. Uh, we are actually describing all the, pro the protocol there. So uh, if you're interested, you can have a look at that and some statistics. But again, what, how can you use that? Uh, simply, you can use that uh, like you use the PDB uh, structures. So, for example, this is the ensemble deposited. And what a research can be interested on is, for example, which part of the IDPs is close to the uh, folded domains inside. And of course, so as, as a PDB file, a structure, a protein structure deposited in PDB, you can uh, just see which are the uh, part of the of the of the intrinsic disorder protein that are close to that and can touch the the, the, the folded domains and so you can do actually uh, science on those on those constructs and this is uh, the second examples i want to show you uh, this is the tau proteins uh, the, the ensemble of the tau proteins so this ensemble was created by nmr sucks molecular dynamics and selected by this uh, protocol and these ensembles contain 75 conformers and this is another publication that was recently published in 2022 and that used this this pad uh, structure to this pad ensembles to validate their uh, methods so basically they saw that there are some there are some amino acid that can be cross-linked and they just check if the protein, the, the ensemble deposited in the bed, uh, it's uh, like validating this kind of results. And, and they found that this is this was validated by eight on this eight and six on the of the 75 models. Uh, finally, I want just to say that uh, we are now part of the 3D Beacon network. So this is a collaboration with the EBI. And this um, it's uh, like it's a way to collect all the structural information of proteins, like again, PDB and alpha fold DB, and put them together and give, like unify this kind of information so that will be, uh, that those will be easier to be like check and use in science. And this is the link if you are interested on 3D beacons. And finally, I want to thank all the collaborators and all the finders and all the people that are working with, with, with me in the lab. And thank you, you thank you to you too for listening to this presentation. And that's it. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Anyone, please, if you have a question, please type in chat or Q and A. I guess I start with the question. Yes. Do you have a quantitative measure for disorder? Like how much, to what extent the protein is disordered? So currently, uh, so disorder can be classified as, a, I mean, if the protein is not, as not, and if the residues is not, as, uh, as is not in a secondary or tertiary structure, it's classified as disordered. 
but uh, the first plot that I show you, the one with the lines and the dot inside, are actually classifying how those ensembles are compact or not. So there is, um, we can predict how could be uh, a protein with the same length uh, if it's folded, how, how, how big is the protein with, uh, with the same length folded and how it is if it's completely stretched. And if we can define the compactness, the compactness of this protein. So we can actually classify them how, many, how much they are compact or not, but of course, they are ensembles, so they can be flexible. So there, the, this measure can have a, an error there. And this is part of the analysis, I mean. So uh, it, it's more, there are different kinds of disorder, but uh, there is, I mean, we cannot classify it as a single kind of disorder. We can say it's disordered, it's more compact, than, it's more extended than a compact uh, protein, but we cannot see more. But of course, we can see how much is moving. Do you connect uh, these disorders with the phenotype? Do you connect? Uh, so it depends. I mean, uh, this is so. This question is um, it's uh, really. I mean, it's not easy to answer that things because it's it's like a normal pro a global protein. So um, it depends on the function of the protein. Of course, there are a lot of uh, um, disordered protein that if they are folded in, a, in in if they become folded, and so it means that they are not any disorder anymore, are rising a, a, a disease even. So yes, in this case, yes, but it's really protein dependent. Okay, thank you. We have a question in Q&A uh, from Lauren listening. Do you see any utility for an ontology of protein configuration as a controlled vocabulary for PED? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so currently we, are, we have our own ontology, uh, but uh, yeah, of course that is not promoting the interoperability of this. So uh, we need to, but so since currently there is no, not a, a, a huge, a big ontology that is described that we are trying to, to, to get that, but that's really, that will be really useful because we can of course uh, put our data and compare those with other database. So that, that's, I guess the point of interoperability. Ah, cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks. We maybe we can get in contact. So if yeah, I don't know if I have to read that, but uh... yeah, thank you. Uh, so the other thing is that how many what species is your uh, focus for this curation? Is it mostly human protein, or are you looking into other species? So actually, since the not a lot of researchers are producing ensembles, we are not focusing any kind of organism. And we have a lot of different, uh, we, we have protein from a lot of different organisms. We, we, we start from human, but we have a lot of, for example, we have a lot of viruses because a disorder is often correlated with, uh, with virus genomes. And we have also some kind of, uh, for example, plant proteins. Uh, actually, I contribute with in, in two of them. So yeah, uh, but 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 we are not focusing any specific organism right now. There are not so many. Uh, we cannot be so specific. I mean, how how many total um, candidates you have in your database? Uh, how many proteins? So currently there are around one hundred uh, proteins, and but. Some of them have a different conditions, so different like so the ensemble are different. So we have more than two hundred total ensemble, but uh, one hundred single proteins, different proteins. There is a question from Rachel Drysdale. The question is: I am aware that some IDP data is now incorporated into Interpro. Uh, please, could you summarize that data pathway for this group? 
is some of your data is now available or integrated into Interpro? I don't think the data from um, from PED, but I'm not sure. They're thinking about MobyDB Lite. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, it's not regarding PED at the moment. Um, we have actually three databases on IDPs in our lab, so. <laughs> Great. We have time for one, one or two more questions. So if I see correctly, there is another question. What is the minimum amount of data resilience? Uh, so if you're talking about PED, uh, um, uh, I mean, there, the ensemble has to be validated using uh, experimental, uh, an experimental technique. So that means that you can create the models as you like, you can do molecular dynamics, you can even generate them randomly, but you have to select them using uh, uh, constraints that are from experiments. So there should be at least one technique, let's say, that it's using to filter them. It can be SACS, NMR, EPR, uh, whatever. And of course, we are trying to get uh, the ensembles that are uh, the, with the highest quality possible and for example now we are trying to select them using uh, some mole probability or um, some kind of control on the how yeah, they thank you yeah thank you very much i think uh, we Thanks. can continue this question and answer um, yeah. uh, on chat it's time to move on to another talk and so eduardo feel free to answer in the chat thank you so much for this wonderful talk thank you Alpin. So our next speaker is Chuck Cook, and he's a program manager of the Global Biodata Coalition. Um, he was previously the sci scientific service manager at EMBL EBI, and he will be presenting today his talk about Global Biodata Coalition. Uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, so thanks, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, this is a, a slight change of direction here because I'm going to talk about an organization rather than uh, a data resource. But some of the things I'm talking about are relevant. Well, all of them are relevant to everyone who's listening. And uh, I'd like to thank Peter and some of the others in the in the earlier session for raising some issues that I can address uh, at least a little bit. Um, so just to set the scene. Uh, Biodata resources have a long history uh, within life sciences uh, where we're, we, we're not explicitly defining biodata resources here, but it's the kind of databases that, we're, that we've been hearing about um, throughout this uh, today's uh, session. Um, life sciences have a long history of sharing data. We have some examples uh, uh, on the, in the images from the 1960s. Uh, the Drosophila Information Service actually began in 1934. It was it, it looks like a journal, but if you look at what they're doing, it's actually data sharing. Um, most of the resources are open access. They archive primary data. Uh, there's a lot. There are many added value knowledge bases, um, uh, and curation is very important, which is why we're speaking to this group. Um, there's a lot of collaboration and data exchange. Again, we've we've had seen examples of that today and there are thousands of resources we don't know how many and i'll talk about a little bit more about that later uh, biodata resources are an infrastructure uh, there there's a healthy ecosystem of resources uh, they're important for life sciences they're essential for research uh, academic research uh, in medicine public health biodiversity food supply um, they're used in academia, by the government, in industry, uh, and they're highly distributed. Uh, and that makes it difficult to examine this as an infrastructure. If you think about other scientific infrastructures, uh, for instance, CERN, it's physics, uh, physics infrastructure, it's at a 
oh, one place, there's a lot of concrete, there's a lot of steel, you can, you can kind of look at it and understand what it's doing. The, res the infrastructure of biodata resources is much harder to get a handle on because it's distributed everywhere. Uh, all of the resources are connected, they exchange data, but they're physically in different places, uh, they're being run by different people, uh, they're stored on different computer systems. So it's a challenge to understand it. It's also a challenge uh, to support it. There are operational challenges. Uh, there's increasing rates of data generation, uh, particularly within the last 20 years with new technologies. Uh, increases demand, for usage demand. It also increases demand for putting things into resources, into databases. Open access policies uh, from funders and also journals have increased demand. Uh, requirements from funders for data management play, uh, plans increase demand for resources the, and new technologies, as I just mentioned. These things increase demand because it means that more and more data must be put into uh, resources and must be made accessible to users. This is great for the scientific community. It's much more challenging for the people paying for these things. Uh, and that's that's the second set here, sustainability challenges. Uh, funding for resources uh, has tended to be haphazard, short term, and distributed unsystematically. Uh, there's not very much coordination among funders, uh, and most resources are funded uh, uh, directly or indirectly through uh, national and charitable funders. Uh, and as I have already alluded to, it's not managed or even thought of as an infrastructure uh, wi widely. <clears throat> These problems are not new. They've been recognized for a long time. They've been recognized by you, the managers of resources and the users of resources, but also by the people paying for them. So in 2015, uh, this paper was published by some people from NIH. Uh, and the gist of the paper was that, that there should be an organization put, set up to help the funders talk about sustaining resources and supporting resources in a more efficient way. Uh, and that was the, the seed for what's become the Global Biodata Coalition. Uh, in 2017, we published these two other papers also describing uh, what we wanted to do. Uh, I shouldn't say we, because I'm not on these papers. I wasn't involved yet, but uh, 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 we in a, in a broader sense. Um, over the next few years, uh, we established a steering group. There were more meetings. We got some seed funding from NIH, from NSF, from Welcome and from ASTAR in Singapore, uh, put together uh, a letter of understanding uh, and uh, started the organization with some funders paying in. Um, the missions of the Global Biodata Coalition currently are to enable funders of resources to better coordinate and manage funding the infrastructure and to ensure sustained support for the infrastructure and prior prioritize support for a set of global core biodata resources. Uh, and who is supporting us? Here is the current membership. These are funders or other organizations which are providing uh, monetary contributions or uh, in some cases, in-kind contributions. And I have to emphasize that these are very small amounts of money. The money they're giving us is only supporting a few people like me who are in the secretariat of the Global Biodata Coalition. There's no money here to support uh, uh, resort databases or resources. This is just to support the small um, uh, effort that GBC is doing to get the funders to talk to each other. And, and our job is to, is to enable the funders to more efficiently spend their money to support the resources. We also have uh, funders who are not full members yet. Uh, they are interested in becoming members and they're, they're, we call them observers. Uh, and for the most part, we hope that they will convert to full members eventually, but for various reasons, uh, often legal reasons, they have trouble uh, providing money for us um, because we're, we're not in their home country, we're not a research project. There are, there are, many, there are many, many reasons why they might not be able to support us initially. Uh, there are also, uh, of course, a much larger set of funders uh, globally who are not even observers yet. Some of them are aware of us, some of them aren't. So if, if your funder is not on this list of observers or is also or is not already a member, 
uh, let your funder know that we're around and maybe they, maybe they want, might want to join or at least get in touch and find out what we're doing. So what are we doing? <clears throat> at the moment, uh, the GBC has a, a, a fairly limited work program with three uh, projects uh, ongoing. We have uh, a knowledge exchange uh, project uh, which is part of the first mission, which is to uh, a lot, basically to get the funders to talk to each other. We have two funder working groups ongoing, one discussing open data strategies, one discussing biodata resource sustainability. Funders, uh, members uh, of GBC are very interested in these questions. Uh, they are, are interested in understanding what other funders do, are doing and we are having uh, open discussions to try to exchange information and hopefully to, in the longer term, come to uh, uh, arrive at better ways to fund resources. Now, these uh, working groups just started last month. We've had one meeting, one two hour meeting each. So there's no, there's no result yet, but it's, it, I'm just telling you what we're doing and we will publicize anything that, that comes out of this uh, in due course. Now, the other thing we're doing, and this is more related to what was uh, discussed uh, earlier in the, uh, uh, in the in the discussion earlier was is is to describe the infrastructure. As I just alluded to, it's poorly described. We don't know too much about it. Uh, we are doing an inventory of global biodata resources, which I'll talk about, and we are selecting a set of global core biodata resources, which I will also talk about. Now, the goal of our inventory, and this relates back to Peter's question of, uh, are there too many resources? Uh, well, before we can answer that question, we have to know how many there are, and that's what we're doing. So we're trying to understand, count how many, how many resources there are uh, with some restrictions on doing that. Has to be done in a reason, we have to be able to do that counting in a reasonable amount of time, and we have to use a reproducible and repeatable methodology. So we're doing that, uh, in the first instance by using the European C API to do uh, tailored searches for biodata resources, which have published papers. And we will augment that with uh, other thing, other resource registries, for instance, um, uh, re three data and fair sharing. So this will count only things that have made a, an effort to talk about themselves. So we, we will certainly miss uh, any data resource that, that hasn't tried to come out and and tell the world about itself. Um, but we are doing this uh, so that we can do it reproducibly and, and periodically and, and monitor changes in the infrastructure. Uh, so we'll, again, we'll talk more about this. This, this. this project is just starting. So we'll talk more about it uh, once we have results and we'll publish, we'll publish on it as well. <clears throat> um, I also want to talk today, especially about global core biodata resources. Um, these are resources defined as have being of fundamental importance to the uh, to all of life sciences. Uh, they provide free and open access. They're used extensively. They're mature. They're authoritative. They have high scientific quality, and they provide a professional standard of delivery. Um, you may recognize this concept from Elixir, which which uh, developed uh, a set of indicators to choose. Uh, core data resources for Elixir within Europe. Um, this is uh, a, an expansion of that concept, but also uh, with, with new indicators and uh, a slight change of focus. Why are we focusing on these uh, resources? Well, if you think about uh, the, the most important resources uh, in the infrastructure, we can think of them as analogous to keystone species in an ecosystem. Um, by identifying them and protecting them, we can help to uh, protect the entire ecosystem. Uh, defining GCBRs uh, will provide benefits. Uh, I won't read through this slide, but there's benefits for researchers, benefits for funding agencies and publishers, uh, for managers, and also for scientists, stakeholders. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this. You can read it uh, later. Uh, when these are when these are shared, um, we have uh, to select uh, core biodata resources. We have a set of indicate five categories of indicators, twenty three indicators 
These are both qualitative and quantitative. It's not a numbers game. Uh, there, there's a, there, there will be uh, reviewers and it will be, uh, they, they aren't compared against each other. Uh, and I wanted to particularly point out uh, that the selection process is ongoing. It's a two-stage process, expressions of interest, which is a very lightweight uh, form to fill out, uh, which will be reviewed, and then full applications will be invited later uh, after review. Um, if you're interested, go to one of the, either our website, which is at the top, or the Zenodo paper that we published, which explains it in more detail, uh, or get in touch with us. There are numerous email addresses, uh, both on our website and uh, on, in the paper. Um, and we encourage you to submit an expression of interest for your resource if, after reading the documentation, you think um, your resource might be a global core biodata resource. Uh, now, I've, I've already run out of time, and I've gone over everything very swiftly. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, and of course, uh, you can ask me more details or go to the um, go to the various papers or our website to find out more. Op open to questions. Thank you very much, Jack, for this wonderful talk. Um, we have one question, and this is from Bridget Melder. Uh, core resources. How will a DB for an emerging data type become a core resource before? multiple resources emerge in the parallel as the area is emerging area without a core resource. <laughs> uh, yeah, Birgit, that's chicken and egg. Um, so the evaluation for global core biodata resources is not restricting, restricting it to one resource for any one data type. Uh, it's the, the, the evaluation will be based upon the resource itself. Um, so, so whether or not there are other resources that 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 have the same data type is not relevant to to the to the reviewers or to the application. Now, having said that, if there's an emerging data type and all of the resources are quite new, it's likely none of them would would make it because there is, uh, if you look at the expression of interest, there's there is actually a, a a category which asks how 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 new the resource is, and if it's not old enough, if it hasn't been a lot around long enough, um, it's not eligible yet. But it will be once it once it hits the, uh, the once once it's been around long enough. So I have a question. So as you said that one has to fill a form or request the interest for the database to be included or recognized, or are you yourself picking up some of the projects that have been in public domain for a long time? No. So the 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 the, the GCBR uh, application process is it's it's basically similar to a grant application. We have we've got an online system. You go to the expression of interest. You register, uh, and you you answer the questions on the form. The 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 questions that are on the form are are published also with that Zenodo paper. So you can look, read them in advance, uh, read the rationale behind them, um, and. The, they're reviewed by an independent panel of reviewers. We and the secretariat have nothing to do with the review process other than to ensure that it, the review process functions. The reviewers will, will make recommendations and the GBC board will ultimately approve or not of those recommendations. Thank you so much. Uh, there, just one more thing. So the expression, I, as I said, the expression of interest um, process is designed to be very lightweight. So there's, there are basically a series of yes, no questions which establish whether the data resource is uh, uh, qualified to, uh, meets the criteria to apply. Um, uh, and and th th those, are, those are fairly mechanical. And then if, 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 if those are a yes, you can submit the expression of interest and then the reviewers will, will review it. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have more information. We also have a YouTube video explaining this in depth if you want to sit through uh, 40 more minutes of me talking and Rachel Drysdale talking. Okay. And yeah, so we can search for that. Yeah, I searched on YouTube for Global Biodata Coalition. At the moment, it's the only video in our channel, so easy to find. Thank you. So you are going to issue some kind of the seal or something that this is approved by the GBC? 
Something it probably like won't that. be a seal. It'll probably be a, a little logo on your website. But yeah, yes, there will be a, 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 some uh, mention of the resources uh, on our website and the resources themselves will be able to put something on their websites. Um, but the bigger picture here is that the is, is to describe the infrastructure. The, the funders need to understand what is in the infrastructure. What are the, what are the key resources? Uh, how many resources are there? And of course, there are other levels of resources. We, we, we don't know if we, how, how far down we'll go, but this is where we're starting. We have in the chat NFT logo. NFT, no, I don't think we'll do that. Well, certainly we've never discussed it. <laughs> um, I should point out that the, the GBC at the moment has uh, six, six uh, people working for it, of which only two are full-time. So um, we have limited bandwidth. Uh, we will expand as more members come in and we have a little bit more funding to, to uh, address things that we're missing. But I think uh, supporting NFTs is going to be uh, pretty low on the on the priority list. Yeah, thank you very much. And we can entertain more questions in chat and Q and A. And Jeff will be happy to answer. Uh, I will now introduce our last speaker of the thank session you. today. Thank you very much, Jack. So welcome. We welcome yes Jasmine Young, and she's a bio curation team lead uh, who is working at. Uh, protein Data Bank at Rutgers, uh, the State University of New Jersey. And here you go, Jasmine. Thank you. Okay. Um, are you able to see the uh, slide? Yeah, we're looking at presenter view. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, they are fine now. Okay. So uh, today I want to switch on the topic and talk about on the data format in the PDB, which has impact to existing and the potential uh, PDB users. Uh, as you, uh, most of you know, PDB is the first open access for uh, biological digital data resource founded in 1971. And it is a single global archive managed by the Worldwide Protein Data Bank organization. And we adhere to FAIR principles. Currently, uh, the PDB archive hosts more than 189,000 experimentally uh, determined structures and uh, the archive grows at about 8% yearly uh, rate. We have about more than 1 million users worldwide uh, that download and use the data. And uh, every day we have more than 2 billion uh, data files downloads. And the, the PDB data uh, are used by more than 430 external data resources. So the uh, PDB uh, data is organized uh, based on the MMCIF format, uh, which is based on the IUCR core CIF dictionary. And it is grouped uh, atoms into residue or uh, we call it chemical component. And then uh, it, it could be those residue or chemical component could be either a free floating ligand or uh, covalently connected into a polymer. And uh, in the polymer chain, uh, if, they are, if they have the same sequences, then those polymer chains are grouped into uh, an entity pro provided by unique entity identifier. And uh, each entity has, uh, ha has its own properties on sequences, protein name, uh, and uh, uh, source, uh, the source organism and the, 
and the sequence references are usually coming from Unipro or uh, uh, GeneBank. PDB format is now called legacy format. Um, it was a, established uh, from 1976, has a fixed uh, column width for 72 characters, uh, similar to a punch card. And uh, as you can see uh, over here, um, that uh, it, it is a fixed column for, uh, to store each data field. So uh, what's the implication? The implication with this fixed column width is that uh, it only allows one character for the chain ID and uh, only uh, allows three uh, characters for the residue ID or chemical component ID and the maximum six columns for number of atoms. And the example shown here is a ribosome structure that uh, has more than 62 chains and the more than uh, 99999 uh, number of atoms that cannot be accommodated by a PDB format file. And this ribosome structures has exposed the PDB format limitation. And uh, because of that, this structures was split into 10 PDB entries which doesn't provide any value to the end users. Um, you cannot validate these structures and you cannot visualize uh, the structure as a whole. So the solution is moving forward with PDB exchange macromolecular sieve called MMCF. It is, as I mentioned, it is based on IUCR uh, core sieve. The syntax is uh, the combination of data names and the values and organized in the data block, we call it categories, as you can see here. Uh, so each uh, category has its own pair of uh, data item and the value. This format is flexible and there is no uh, limitation to the length of, the, uh, of each data item. And uh, it, it is, um, very uh, very easy to maintain, machine readable, and uh, it can be extended easily to support fast evolving uh, scientific uh, field. We do not work alone. We collaborate uh, with community to set data standards in developing MMC dictionary. We have been working with uh, the structure determination software uh, package uh, developers, as well as visualization software tools. And uh, we have uh, supported the NMR, uh, small angle scattering. And uh, also uh, recently we have extended the MMC dictionary to support computed models, uh, core model SIF. We provide many resources uh, for uh, the, the tools uh, for uh, users to adopt MMC format. And uh, we also provide uh, conversion tools for people to be able to uh, translate a PDB format into MMC format. The resource is available at mmcif.pdb.org. So uh, it is end of the life for PDB file format and uh, the PDB uh, deposition continue to grow. And we expect uh, by spring 2014, we are going to run out of three liter uh, code for residue ID or chemical component ID. And by that time, uh, we are going to extend the residue ID to be beyond three character ID. And uh, when that is in place, um, entries containing uh, these new IDs will no longer produce PDB format files. And uh, so uh, 
depositors will need to, uh, we, we will make only the MMC formatted file available uh, to the PDB archive. And the MMC uh, deposition is already mandatory for all the crystallographic entries and uh, the uh, deposition and bar curation system has been using MMC as the framework uh, for the infrastructure and um, the processed coordinate file are returned to depositors in MMC format and as well as the legacy uh, PDB format. So moving forward, uh, we continue working with the community software developers to ensure that uh, their tools support MMC uh, file format and to ensure that they are able to pass the data uh, in the MMC format. And we uh, asking software developers to support MMC to correct any assumptions uh, as to field, field width and the column width and uh, making sure achieve this in two years uh, before we uh, Im implement the legal ID that is beyond three-letter code. I would like to uh, draw your attention that uh, we have many positions uh, open at rcsb.org. Please uh, visit our website at the www.rcsb.org slash pages slash jobs uh, to find out more about the position available at the uh, RCSB PDB. And I would like to thank NSF and I GMS and I uh, and NIAID. NCI and the DOE for uh, funding. And I would like to acknowledge John Westbrook um, who has recently passed away. He uh, has contributed to the development of MMC data standards and the dictionary uh, for 25 years. And now uh, Ezra Pesha uh, is, has taken over this responsibility as the MMC dictionary man manager. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for this updated information on PDB. Thank you. Now we can have uh, questions. Please feel free to type in the chat or Q&A. Uh, one thing I also would like to uh, point out is that uh, we, uh, in, in the planning of extending residue ID to be beyond three characters, we also have planned to extend PDB ID itself and uh, with the PDB underscore prefix and followed by six digits. And that will be the new format for PDB ID. And this ID, um, has been available in the new entries that is in the uh, MMC format files. We have a question from Emmanuel. And the question is, I am missing a lot the ligand viewer you provided in the past. Um, can, uh, I, I'm not so sure what Deacon viewer uh, this is uh, reporting uh, is referring to. Oh, okay. So, okay, so that is about feature. our website. Um, yeah, I will bring this back to our uh, website team and then let them know uh, if uh, this can be uh, provided. Uh, likely, it, it has been deprecated. So RCSB PDB has two teams. One is um, collaborating with worldwide PDB to uh, curate and, and uh, making sure the data are confirmed to MMC format and then release this data to the public. And we have a second team that's the data out team. They are responsible for maintaining rcsb.org website and provide uh, tools to uh, for users to explore 
the data that are curated by the data in team. So I will uh, bring this, uh, your consent back to the data out team. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Do you have any mechanism of uh, replacing the older versions or maybe uh, say if there were structures that were low resolution structures and now the high resolution structures are available, how do you do the archiving? Yes, very good question. So we uh, enable the coordinated version in about uh, one and a half years ago and in a way that now depositors can request to update their coordinates and uh, retain the original PDB ID. We version the coordinate file. And so we now PDB has two FTP tree. One is the main FTP tree. The other one is called version FTP tree. So the latest version of the coordinate files are always made available at the main FTP tree. And uh, each major version of the files is retained under the version FTP. So users can go to the version FTP to get the older version of the coordinate file if they wish to do so. And uh, that version FTP uh, also include the latest uh, version of the files. So uh, depositors are encouraged to update their coordinates to improve data quality if they wish to do so. Thank you so much. Panelists, please feel free to ask any other questions and attendees you can type in the chat or Q and A. One more question perhaps. Okay, so thank you, Sushma, for sharing the invited speaker talks, and uh, thank you, Philip, and our panelists and speakers, too. Uh, and also thank you to all of you for joining this first session of ISB 2022. Uh, if you, uh, since you already registered for the conference, you don't need to register again because you're going to uh, get the link for the next Zoom session uh, as soon as it approaches, and uh, um, follow us on Twitter so you can get updates it's on uh, what we are doing uh, and uh, the next session of uh, the conference. Uh, and we will also post uh, a recording to YouTube and the slides uh, uh, will be available on F1000 Research uh, as soon as possible. And finally, if uh, you're interested, join ISB as members as we have uh, uh, benefits uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, always advertise the events uh, via mailing list. And uh, this said, thank you all for joining today's session and uh, we hope to see you soon. Next session is going to take place uh, June 7th. So thank you everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.